THE JULY GRASS by Richard Jeffreys Recorded for LibriVox Coffee Break Collection, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruth Golding THE JULY GRASS by Richard Jeffreys a July fly went sideways over the long grass. His wings made a burr about him like a net, beating so fast they wrapped him round with a cloud. Every now and then, as he flew over the trees of grass, a taller one than common stopped him, and there he clung, and then the eye had time to see the scarlet spots, the loveliest colour, on his wings. The wind swung the bennet, and loosened his hold, and away he went again over the grasses, and not one jot did he care if they were Poa, or Festica, or Bromus, or Hordeum, or any other name. Names were nothing to him. All he had to do was to whirl his scarlet spots about in the brilliant sun, rest when he liked, and go on again. I wonder whether it is a joy to have bright scarlet spots, and to be clad in the purple and gold of life. Is the colour felt by the creature that wears it? The rose, restful of a dewy morn before the sunbeams have topped the garden wall, must feel a joy in its own fragrance, and know the exquisite hue of its stained petals. The rose sleeps in its beauty. The fly whirls his scarlet-spotted wings about, and splashes himself with sunlight like the children on the sands. He thinks not of the grass and sun. He does not heed them at all, and that is why he is so happy, any more than the barefoot children ask why the sea is there, or why it does not quite dry up when it ebbs. He is unconscious. He lives without thinking about living. And if the sunshine were a hundred hours long, still it would not be long enough. No, never enough of sun and sliding shadows that come like a hand over the table to lovingly reach our shoulder. Never enough of the grass that smells sweet as a flower, not if we could live years and years equal in number to the tides that have ebbed and flowed, counting backwards four years to every day and night. Backwards still, till we found out which came first, the night or the day. The scarlet-dotted fly knows nothing of the names of the grasses that grow here, where the sward nears the sea. And thinking of him, I have decided not to willfully seek to learn any more of their names, either. My big grass-book I have left at home, and the dust is settling on the gold of the binding. I have picked a handful this morning of which I know nothing. I will sit here on the turf, and the scarlet-dotted flies shall pass over me, as if I too were but a grass. I will not think. I will be unconscious. I will live. Listen. That was the low sound of a summer wavelet striking the uncovered rock over there beneath in the green sea. All things that are beautiful are found by chance, like everything that is good. Here by me is a praying rug just wide enough to kneel on, of the richest gold inwoven with crimson. All the sultans of the East never had such beauty as that to kneel on. It is indeed too beautiful to kneel on, for the life in these golden flowers must not be broken down even for that purpose. They must not be defaced, not a stem bent. It is more reverent not to kneel on them, for this carpet prays itself. I will sit by it and let it pray for me. It is so common, the bird's foot lotus. It grows everywhere. Yet 
if I purposely searched for days, I should not have found a plot like this, so rich, so golden, so glowing with sunshine. You might pass by it in one stride, yet it is worthy to be thought of for a week, and remembered for a year. Slender grasses, branched round about with slenderer boughs, each tipped with pollen and rising in tiers, cone-shaped, too delicate to grow tall, cluster at the base of the mound. They dare not grow tall, or the wind would snap them. A great grass, stout and thick, rises three feet by the hedge, with a head another foot nearly, very green and strong and bold, lifting itself right up to you. You must say, what a fine grass! Grasses whose awns succeed each other alternately, grasses whose tops seem flattened, others drooping over the shorter blades beneath, some that you can only find by parting the heavier growth around them, hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands. The kingly poppies on the dry summit of the mound take no heed of these, the populace, their subjects so numerous they cannot be numbered. A barren race they are, the proud poppies, lords of the July field, taking no deep root, but raising up a brilliant blazon of scarlet heraldry out of nothing. They are useless, they are bitter, they are allied to sleep and poison and everlasting night, yet they are forgiven because they are not commonplace. Nothing, no abundance of them, can ever make the poppies commonplace. There is genius in them, the genius of colour, and they are saved. Even when they take the room of the corn we must admire them. The mighty multitude of nations, the millions and millions of the grass, stretching away in intertangled ranks, through pasture and mead from shore to shore, have no kinship with these their lords. The ruler is always a foreigner. From England to China the native-born is no king. The poppies are the Normans of the field. One of these on the mound is very beautiful, a width of petal, a clear silkiness of colour three shades higher than the rest. It is almost dark with scarlet. I wish I could do something more than gaze at all this scarlet and gold and crimson and green. Something more than see it, not exactly to drink it or inhale it, but in some way to make it part of me, that I might live it. The July grasses must be looked for in corners and out-of-the-way places, and not in the broad acres. The scythe has taken them there. By the wayside on the banks of the lane, near the gateway. Look, too, in uninteresting places, behind incomplete buildings on the mounds cast up from abandoned foundations, where speculation has been and gone. There weeds that would not have found resting place elsewhere grow unchecked, and uncommon species and unusually large growths appear. Like everything else that is looked for, they are found under unlikely conditions. At the back of ponds, just inside the enclosure of woods, angles of cornfields, old quarries, that is where to find grasses, or by the sea in the brackish marsh. Some of the finest of them grow by the mere roadside. You may look for others up the lanes in the deep ruts. Look, too, inside the hollow trees by the stream. In a morning you may easily garner together a great sheaf of this harvest. Cut the larger stems aslant, like the reeds imitated deep in old green glass. You must consider as you gather them the height and slenderness of the stems, the droop and degree of curve, 
the shape and colour of the panicle, the dusting of the pollen, the motion and sway in the wind. The sheaf you may take home with you, but the wind that was among it stays without. End of the July Grass